Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental from my apartment in bed I'm Andrew Weeby with my partners in soccer, David Goss, Charlie Davies. The nice uh, background noise, Charlie, I can hear it. There's some, there's some children playing yeah, in twins. your abode. I hope that it's like, it's like, you know, it's like wind chimes. It just makes you feel good, man. Yeah, I feel great. You know, it's the twins running around, getting out of the, getting all the energy out of them. Um, you came home from school and they're ready to go. You know, that energy between the two of them reminds me of uh, Alejandro Pozuelo and Pablo Piatti. Just two knuckleheads just getting together to do silly stuff. We're going to talk about what they did on Tuesday against Montreal. We've also got Julian Araujo coming in from the LA Galaxy. Tom Bogert, Tommy Scoots will be here to talk MLS transfer news. And we're going to wrap up all these games midweek. But first, the PK routine that turned into an epic failure. I have to start with this. It's my favorite moment of the entire week. I've just like cackled for two days about this. There's so many different elements of this. First of all, Josie Althor's reaction to them doing this and having the goal called back is just perfect. He's like, what are these guys doing? What's happening? Mm -hmm. Their joy, once they completed the play, before they realized it was going to be called back, was beautiful. Charlie, it was like your twins having some mischief together and then just like getting a little bit in trouble or kind of succeeding. And then they just run together and hug and smile. I I loved this moment. And I wonder one, how much time they have on their hands. Like these two guys are just sitting around just coming up with bad ideas, like just coming up with the worst ideas and thinking not just, Hey, this is a bad idea, but thinking we should do this in games. And I want to know how often pro players think about this stuff, but don't do it. Well, I'll tell you right now, there were so many times playing with Lee Wynn where <laughs> oh my god, I, if I'm on two goals and, I, and I, we win a pen, I'd say, okay, let me take the pen. He's like, no, I take all the penalty kicks. So I said, okay, what about if we do this? You, have to win, you get an assist and I score kind of thing. Was, he's like, never. It's never happening. I've always wanted to do this. We've done it in training a couple of times, but uh, it's, it's hard to pull off, especially with VAR. You can't you can't get into the box before they touch the ball. But you don't real need risk. to. That's the thing because I do. I've never played you pro do. soccer, but I've brought this up to every person I've ever played with, and everyone shot it down. No one sees it coming, so you don't need a head you start. Say that you say that, but the the goalie's diving, and no one no one even runs in when the normal shot is taken, right? And no one no defender ever charges the box. Let's talk about facts. All defenders. Don't allow you to get into the box because they think you're going to get the tap in off the rebound. So even if they don't know that play is coming, they're trying to get to the spot before you do. Charlie, that's why you you got a Trojan horse this thing. Every single shooter who has a shot saved scores on the rebound because no one gets in. False. False. You got a Trojan horse this thing. You got to like go around and make sure all the Johnny Tryhard defenders don't know what's coming and you definitely can't go into the early and you definitely can't go over the arc that was also the mistake yeah, that's, here that's the worst from piotti like what's he doing why the arc just go to the corner of the arc in the box act like you're like tying your shoe messing around throw him off a little bit and get this thing done you gotta sell it you gotta sell it but you also have to do it i think it's genius it Thierry Henry, you had time. an instant replay this is a, a gratuitous instant replay plug charlie you had an anecdote you being the arsenal fan that you are about Thierry Henry trying this. So that's the added yes. wrinkle here. The added wrinkle is the irony in the whole situation. <laughs> Thierry Henry and Robert Perez pulled, tried to pull this off against Manchester City. And Robert Perez, they said, you know, they talked about it the day before. They did it in training. It came off, no problems. But in the game, he said he just froze and he, he like mistouched it. And it was a debacle. It ended up being a free kick for Manchester City. And it went the other way, similar to the same way it happened in this Toronto FC game. But later in the game, there was a penalty, and Robert Perez banged it, banged it in. So they still got the result. And so you could laugh about it after because, ah, we, yeah, we messed up, but we got the three points, right? This, you lose the match. 1-0. <laughs> and you had a pen. Yeah, I would be steaming. Because it's all fun in games if you get a result. And you can say, ah, we, we should have pulled it off or we shouldn't have done this yet, but we got the three points. So it doesn't really matter. Can that, That's not part of this conversation. Can I throw something in here? That's probably borderline problematic for Canada. Do At it. this point, Pasuelo and PT are playing against themselves. 
because they do not feel challenged in this only playing in Canada cycle of oh, just beating Vancouver and Montreal game don't in a game. Do out. Don't do that. That's Van- Charlie. Van- that's Van- literally Van- what happened. Vancouver, yes, Vancouver. <laughs> they 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 are they are not good, and, and that's being polite. They this are one, not good. This but, was Steph Curry, Clay Thompson it's, levels of like, bro. Let's see if we're down twenty in the fourth quarter if we can still that, come. You back. and you could probably do that against the Vancouver. They are that bad, <laughs> but for Montreal. They have quality. They have, and it's yeah, little, I don't, it's more of an Eastern Conference rivalry too. That's on the line. I would say if they're up three zero and you want to do that and you want to disrespect Montreal, <laughs> okay. But when you when you're when you need to win these games, that these games actually matter. You, yeah. you can't do that. You you can't get away with it, and you shouldn't be able to pull that off. And I also right don't now. mean to disrespect all the love in Vancouver and Montreal, you know, they're a great city. Oh yeah. Great yeah. city. But we're not talking about the city. We're talking about. The- <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to say this is a positive sign. Yes. They did not get the three points. And by the way, that was ironic too. Cause Rudy Camacho is the one who scored the goal for mm. Montreal. And Rudy Camacho is the one who came out and said, Hey, we didn't want to play that Thursday after the boycotts on Wednesday against Toronto. And these guys did. So I felt like there was some like ball don't oh, yeah. lie karma aspects of this where like Montreal deserved that. And Toronto deserved to kind of get it. Uh, you know, to have the irony come back and bite them. But I think it'll pay off in the future. Look how much these two dudes love each other. Like Pozuelo and Piatti, this is this is like a bromance right now. Mm-hmm. Like to come up with that, to be sitting next to each other at the locker, to be smiling, laughing, patting each other on the back, like getting that big bear hug, and then experiencing a little suffering too together, that brings a team together. Your two DPs are loving it. And now Josie might not have, but he'll be okay. He'll be fine. All right, let's get into the show. We're going to talk to Juliana Rojo very soon. LA Galaxy outside back, maybe winger, U.S. Youth International. The Galaxy are rolling. They got a big win in Portland, 3-2. There was some controversy there as well uh, to go with the offside call that Jeremy Obobese scored on, but then wasn't counted. Um, we're going to talk about LA. Jimmy Chara we're- had one call back too, like 30 seconds before yeah. that. Uh-huh. And that prompted a certain somebody, Rhymes Smith, Smerit Smallson, <laughs> to get back on Twitter, which was very entertaining. He doesn't tweet anymore. Say. We got good Caleb, and Merritt doesn't tweet anymore. Yeah, exactly. It's a new exactly. world. Oh, by the way, the crew are in first. Boom. We'll go through all the midweek stuff. We'll hit the mailbag. We'll do all that good stuff. But look, there is something bigger this month in September. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can see Kick Childhood Cancer, supported by Continental Tire. They are uh, throwing some weight behind that this September. Uh, so show off your scarves. We're so happy to have gotten ours. You'll see great things happening around the league this month. I mean, if you're watching, you'll see those armbands, the 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 yellow ones. You'll see the corner flags. There'll be a logo on the ball. But much bigger than that is the uh, is the donations. And look, you you can be a part of this if you're listening right now. They're called messages of hope, and you can send them to kids battling this terrible disease. Use the hashtag Kick Childhood Cancer. Whether it be support, whether it be something cool, whether it be um, just a general message of hope. Send it out. Use the hashtag. Every single time you do, Continental is going to make a $25 donation to the Children's Oncology Group. That's up to 50 k That's an easy 50 k that we can throw into this fight. If you were maybe paying attention last night before the game in Atlanta against Inter-Miami, a forgettable game in every single way, this is Kellen Warnick. He got to nail the first virtual Golden Spike pregame. He's a cancer survivor. He was just declared cancer-free. Huge congratulations to Kellen Warnick on that. It was a three-year fight against Burkitt Lymphoma. Uh, He is frequently at Land United camps, clinics. He's at games. He's a force to be reckoned with on the pitch. So well done to him, and we're so happy for him to get that opportunity. And all of this reminds me that we had started something that we have not followed through on in the best way, which is a monthly cause that we want to get behind as a show. Producers, hosts, we bring the call up in as well to donate to a worthy cause. This month, because it is Kick Childhood Cancer Month, because Continental's getting behind it too, I think we've got to find something in this space to be a part of, whether it be just straight cash, just money to an organization we think help, whether it be like a care package. You know, I remember when I was a kid, I I remember every jersey I got for Christmas, for whatever the occasion was, and I didn't get many. My, My parents didn't spring for that kind of stuff. But I remember wearing those down threadbare, how much they meant to me. Maybe we can put together some care packages. I don't know. You guys have any ideas, any thoughts? Charlie, I know this month in particular means a lot to you and your family. Um, Mm -hmm. 
it's it's a it's a big month for you, man. It is, and and you know when you see uh, children suffering and and going through uh, a battle that is is putting their lives on on the line at such an early age, you want to do anything you possibly can to help them, whether it's to take their mind off off of the daily struggles, to to take their mind off of uh, dealing with the uh, side effects of medication. Um, just to, to make them feel better and to know they're not alone, that they have support. And so whether it's a blanket, whether it's as simple as a blanket, uh, um, some training cards, trading cards, some, you know, a soccer ball, pictures, anything, anything will help them to distract them and, and, and give them, put them in a positive mind frame. Um, I think that's really important. And, and that's why I love this month. And I love what we're doing here. Anybody know somebody out there, an MLS fan, a kid who's going through something that, you know, ultimately is unfair and that we want to prevent, but we want to help them along the line. Let us know. Extra time at MLSsoccer.com, 401-206-0MLS. We'll go do searching ourselves and try to figure out in the next week what we're going to get behind and hopefully uh, have some of you out there who listen to the show and enjoy it every single week get behind too. Uh, all right, let's talk soccer. Remember, use that hashtag, kick childhood cancer, to send those messages of hope. That's an easy 25 bucks. And we'll start with this. Uh, it's a slightly... Higher fee than $25, $18 million. That's reportedly how much Saudi Arabian team Al Nasser is going to pay for Pity Martinez. So what, 20 months after he signed in January 2019? For all intents and purposes, it looks like Pity Martinez is gone. And this thing escalated quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. Flupe Cardenas from The Athletic first got the ball rolling. And then we heard Darren Eels on the radio in Atlanta last night before the match against Inter-Miami, a scoreless draw, forgettable in every way, other than this news, basically say, yeah, that's the deal. Those are the parameters. They reportedly bought Pity for $14 million back in 2019. So that's a, that's a nice little profit, which is wow. surprising because Pity Martinez has not lived up to the South American Player of the Year billing and the, the hype and the price tag and the River Plate and the Libertadores and everything else that came along with it in five stripes. Like when you saw this news, what did you think, Charlie? What was your the first thing that popped into your brain? Initially, I thought, wow, how fortunate Atlanta United are to have a player who's, who's come in to replace Miguel Almoron and not live up to expectations. And sure, you have a coach uh, who comes in, a new coach, it's not Tata Martino, who tries to implement a, a style of play that's not beneficial for the roster that you have. And guys aren't happy to play in this formation. Guys aren't happy in general. And typically when you're not enjoying the game, you're not enjoying the way you're, the style of play, you're not going to get the best out of these players. And so for Atlanta United to sell PT Martinez for $4 million extra, so you're, they're getting four million profit from selling PD Martinez, who hasn't played well, is a is a is a is a steal. It's a great job because they haven't got the best out of them yet. They're still making a profit on a player who was expected to really fulfill the the shoes of Miguel Amaron. So well job, uh, well done on the job. But again, I, I think it's they they're very lucky to get that. They probably just showed the highlight tapes of him at River and kind of forgot what he had done at Atlanta United to get that that extra 4 million because um, you know, a player who was brought in and, and played 32 games, only five goals and nine assists, that that's not good enough. How, how are you getting $18 million for a player who hasn't lived up to the bill? I've got seven goals, 11 assists and 39 regular season games, but it still holds. The thing that I would say about all this is that they didn't really give pity the best opportunity to succeed. I don't personally think. Tata Martino was such an integral part of all of this. And I'm sure that was part of what Pity Martinez looked at and said, yes, this is the right place for me to go, Atlanta United. I have sort of like a kindred soul. I have a countryman to lean on. Um, and, and even if they bring somebody else in, sort of that ethos will stay, this attacking style where I can get out and run and be at my best because I'm at my best in the open field, very similarly to Miguel Almiron. He probably looked at Almiron and thought, oh, yeah, I can do all that. I'm a more proven player than this guy. I've done more than he has at club level by far. And it just didn't happen because they switched everything up. They switched up their tactics. The, they switched up some of the star players going into this year. Their coach clearly did not have the locker room. There was a dysfunction and a lack of unity that definitely was not there before. 
And now Pity Martinez is the guy who has to come in, not knowing the city, not knowing the league, not knowing the situation, not knowing any of this, and find a way to integrate with that amount of pressure. Like the amount of pressure on him, Almiron didn't face that. Joseph Martinez didn't face that. I, I can't, there haven't been a lot of players who have faced that. And I know he had that at River Plate. I know that he felt that there, but this is different. That was his home. That's where he belonged. That's where he was part of that community. He had to push his way into this one. And it, it just never happened. The thing I worry about for Atlanta United, for sort of the idea of we go to South America and pull the Almiron, which is get an up-and-coming talent and flip them to Europe, get money from it, and also increase our ability to recruit. What does this mean for that pipeline? Mm -hmm. Because if I'm a 20-year-old, 21, 22, 23-year-old player in South America, I'm not thinking I want to go to Saudi Arabia at 27. I'm thinking I want to go to Europe. So it works like dollars and cents, but does it work for their larger scheme? That is what I would ask. Here's a question for you, Dave. Is Pity Martinez a bust? When we look back on this tenure, this transfer, this entire saga, what will the lasting impression be for Pity Martinez in Atlanta United? Probably nothing. I think Atlanta United fans won't talk about him. It'll be one of those things where you're like, remember when he played for them? But I agree with what you were saying. You were saying in the Atlanta point of view of like, what does this mean for future signings? I actually think it might hurt the league in general. This was such a high-profile move and had the ability, I think, to be a game-changing move. And look, Reynoso just signed. Christian Pavone's playing well. Like, there will still be good players coming from South America. But PT was a unique one in that he just won that award. He had just won Copa Lib for River. And he was a little older than those guys. I don't think it was a come here and then go to Europe move for PT. I think this was where he was going to make his name. And that is a really cool scenario to have had in MLS because guys like Valeri and Nacho Piatti were in the twilights of their career and they did those things, but not in the same way. And I thought that this had a potential to be something special. And I'm sad that it didn't happen. I'm sad from on the field because when you saw flashes of it, the guy's awesome at soccer and he could be really special. I, we talked about it with Felipe Cardenas, really good guy. And in this whole time of struggling was first to do interviews in a team, let's be real, that not everyone always wants to speak, was always quick to answer and say, it's on me. Never blamed Frank DeBoer, said it even in Argentina. All those things, I think he's shown to be a good guy. And I thought it had the potential to be like, this is it now. You can play at Flamengo or you can play in MLS, which would have been epic. And it might still happen, but that's too bad. Where they go from here, I think what we've seen and what you have to be smart about right now is there are deals available. And we've talked about it a little bit. The low-end deals are going to get hurt. $5 million, $7 million and below, like Paul Tenorio said. That's going to hurt MLS selling. But I think what we've seen, like Austin FC has done, there is moves out there available because the transfer markets are broken. They're a little weird. Some teams are struggling. So I don't think Atlanta should guarantee they're going to get someone. But you have to be open to the idea that someone you didn't think you could afford or someone you didn't think you could get now is all of a sudden available. I completely agree with that. What I would say about Pity and Atlanta United is that I think this will be remembered as sort of a package deal. It will be remembered as a team that was at the very top or felt that way. And then I think the biggest mistake is the Frank DeBoer mistake. Like that's the mistake that had the trickle down that had the domino effect all throughout this roster, mm -hmm. whether it be Julian Gressel or whether it be uh, Joseph Martinez, who reportedly wasn't happy a good chunk of last year. Pity Martinez, Ezekiel Barco. Like, you needed somebody who was going to level up your investments. And instead of doing that, you had to hit the reset button. Like, they basically – it wasn't a rage quit, but they basically had to be like, oh, whoops, oh, we hit the button in the – weird, the game got reset. Everything is lost. Our save is gone. We've got to start – I think this is where Atlanta United is, given where they were post-MLS Cup glow, given where they were at the end of Tata Martino's reign, given where they were and where we thought that they would be – Right now, and they're just not there. Would you they're sign not, somebody? To Charlie? Would you go out Sorry? and make a big signing this summer? Would you replace Pity Martinez, or would you wait around and look for a manager? We don't know. Maybe they. I wrote this. Maybe they know who their manager is going to be, and they either can't get him out of contract right now, or they're just not ready to announce it in the middle of this pandemic. Maybe mm -hmm. they're already talking to somebody and saying, "You're going to be the guy. Who should we go get? Help guide us." I don't know that, but I do think it would be. Um, rash let's say to continue on this same path where there's a disconnect between the manager 
and the sporting director and the players that are coming in. Because for their model to work, I think it's much more likely that model works when the manager is integrated and the players believe and are committed to that manager. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, if you're going to go out and get someone now, they have to be a proven winner. Someone you know that can adjust to, to different styles, different tactics, and has that good mentality that he's going to be a, a good guy in the locker room. He's going to get the best out of people. And he's, he's not afraid to adapt and change. If you but don't, but you are you, describing PT right now. I'm just throwing that out there. Right? Nothing's no, a guarantee. No. You literally because, just, a guy who no, won because Copa Libertadores he, he can't play, positions. He, he can't play different styles. He can't play different styles. What, well, I think there was no style, is the problem, which back to Weeby's point is you should probably have a coach before you sign this guy. If right? if if you're not getting a player who is a proven winner, who you don't you don't you know where he's gonna be on the field. If it's if it's a Suarez, let's just put it that way, which I don't think it, they're gonna go after a Suarez, obviously or Joseph not. Martinez. But if if you were getting a player like a Suarez who you know exactly what you're gonna get out of him, no matter what formation or situation, he's gonna be your your point man, he's gonna score goals. Same thing if you're gonna get a, a midfielder. A creative number 10 who can fit in any system because of the way they play. Maybe they're they're fast, they're pacey, they're quick, and you know what you're going to get out of them no matter what. And they're a star, sure. You you sign them now. But but that but as they unless said, you, that's, unless that's you PT, find man. that guy, unless yeah. but this is the problem. Guy. They they had all that in place. Like PT Martinez was walking into a into a team that he thought he had all of that. Yeah, you I, knew what kind of player I, I am. You, you play the style of play that I thrive in. And then they tore it up by getting the wrong manager. No, and no just, I would I'm, argue. I'm, I'm going to argue that they brought in PT Martinez to replace Al Maron. And they thought he could give you exactly what Al Maron gave you. And that was not the case. But they didn't the team play was the same set up. stalker. The, Almi, the, the, the team was set up. He did play the way Al Maron did. They didn't set up the team. And let's go into this as well, because it's not all on Frank DeBoer. What has Carlos Bocanegra done with this roster? Because PT Martinez comes in, that's a problem. And then you lose LGP. Then you've now you've lost Nagby. You've lost Parker, obviously retiring. You lost Gressel. So the team, the Alba, Hector, the yeah, team is Alba. worse. I don't know that Elmi Roan would have played as well in the team last year and this year as he did under Tata. So I don't think it falls on PT. Uh, to Charlie's point, if you have a player that's a home run and you have the chance now, you take it but you should probably have it in the idea of what your coach who's coming in. A hundred percent. Can Agreed. I ask this of you, Charlie? What, what's going to happen to Ezekiel Barco now? Cause I'm, I'm making some jokes about hitting the reset button and like rage mm -hmm. quitting. And, but that's kind of where they're at, mm -hmm. you know, Felipe again, who does a really kick-ass job with the coverage of Atlanta United was on Instagram this morning saying that Atlanta United value Barco more than they do PT who they just got 18 million for, but it is hard I, as someone who guaranteed a double-double for Barco last year, it is hard even for I to imagine a sort of turnaround for Ezekiel Barco that would get him in that valuation zone. But I also know that he is a U-20 Argentina star, that he is a guy with a great pedigree there who mm -hmm. was on a huge upward trajectory at Independiente and did it in big moments and maybe just hasn't settled in Atlanta. Like, what do you do with Ezekiel Barco now? Because that's part of this manager equation, too. And by the way, what Carlos Bocanegra has in front of him is you've got to find a way to capitalize on your asset because you haven't done it so far. Yeah. I mean, he's 21 years old, so you have time. He's not he's not as old as Petey Martinez. The problem with Barco, and he's a talented player, is you need to put him in the right position to succeed. He's not a winger. He's not a, a he can play number eight, but if he's closer to the, the strikers, if he can play underneath, that's when he's going to excel. When you're not relying on him to, to do the dirty work, to be a defender, to get on the wings, he's a player that likes to, to float. And the problem with him playing with Peter Martinez is they both want to do the same thing. You can't have two players trying to do the same thing when El Maron was specifically good at getting in behind, at beating players on the dribble and creating for Joseph Martinez, who just had to put himself in a good position to finish. They didn't have that with P.T. Martinez. And you saw also kind of like a little bit of a power struggle of who's the best player, P.T. Martinez coming in, Joseph saying, hey, this is my club, this is my team. There is no there is no questions. You play to, to make me better. You play the way you got to feed me at all times. You got to look for me. And I think that also, uh, Frank DeBoer didn't help out that situation whatsoever. So it really is apparent uh, that you bring in a coach that already knows what he's dealing with 
sees Barco and says, okay, I'm going to get the most out of them if you're not selling them beforehand. Can I just throw something in the universe just to see if I can make it happen? Always. Memphis the pies on a free uh, any year, six month pre contract coming up. So I like how you 26 guys years that old out there. Memphis, lo- I'm living in Atlanta. He, he, lo- he loves universe. the United States. I'm a he that loves out the U.S. He, he loves the good United States. Uh, Atlanta could be a good spot for Let's him. He's go. got some musical aspirations. Mm-hmm. It could yeah. be a decent spot. I don't hate it. I don't hate it. By the way, we mentioned we're not going to talk about the game itself because, oh boy, I don't know if you watched it, but it was misery. Inter Miami <laughs> though had a nice rumor come out here. Jeff Carlisle, part of the reporting. Stephen Goff, the Washington Post. I mean, everybody's reporting this at this point. Then Gonzalo Higuain is going to be their third designated player. The DC United has traded the discovery rights to enter Miami for 50K in allocation money, kind of a standard number in deals like this. If you're not going to be the team that signs them, you're not going to hold it up, so you trade it for that nominal amount. Uh, is that the right DP signing for Inter Miami? Because for whatever reason, I don't know if it's because of the way it ended at Juventus for Gonzalo Higuain. It doesn't, like, I feel like five, six years ago on this show, Dave, we would have... This would have led the show. This would have been everything. We would have been taught if a team was going to go sign Gonzalo Higuain, and I know it's a different time period for him and his career too, it would have been huge. And now maybe because it's Inter Miami and we have transfer fatigue with them or because teams are spending and big players are coming in or he was told, hey, your surplus to requirements at Juve doesn't feel as big. Am I just jaded? Like, is something wrong with me? Should uh, I be yeah. more excited? I think you should be more excited. And I'll tell you, because typically when a proven goal scorer in Europe comes over to MLS, they still, they do well. They score goals. Look at, look at David Villa. Look at Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Thierry Henry. I'm just naming players. Wayne Rooney. I'll throw some other. Wayne Rooney. Guys I who think come over Robbie Keane is goals. the comparison that I made. Like sort of in that early 30s phase where he was. Robbie Keane was, was a, Robbie Keane was a was different playing. MLS. That's fair. I'm just saying, I'm saying he was that sort of player at that point of his career and came and produced. I'm just saying a lot of those guys are a different MLS. Charlie, I don't disagree with what you're saying. Iguain won scoring titles in Italy. Great. Those Napoli teams were awesome. He's not on Via or Zlatan or on Reese level. Okay, right? Joseph Martinez player. came in as a backup. Fair. I mean, he but was a winger at a Torino. A completely Syria. different conversation. Okay. You're talking about a 24-year-old or a 23-year-old who hasn't found his spot. This is Gonzalo Iguain at the mm-hmm. end of his career. A guy who won, you've seen fail in places, so it's not guaranteed. Via scored everywhere he went, never failed. You knew the level you were going to get from him at a minimum. So Higuain has doesn't have that exact proof of concept. And the other is what we've all talked about. I don't think we should say been promised because I, I, I think wouldn't say in failed, looking either, back, by the way, I think what? failed is I think he failed, failed at Chelsea. Is, is a strong word. I think He's, he failed at Chelsea. I think still, he failed at Real scored, Madrid. Still scored Until, goals. Until he got to Napoli, I think Napoli was a step down and there was questions about him as a player at the top mm-hmm. level and he did amazing things there. And then he's been good at Juve and he started for Argentina. There's no doubt that the guy is doing major league soccer if, if, he's if at, Napoli he is, is yeah, a step down. For sure. He is at a level that very few players that have played in MLS in history or in the world are mm-hmm. at. But we have all convinced ourselves that they were going to sign James Rodriguez in, their, in his prime, that they were in for guys who were starting – yeah. And in on Zapata. starting lineups. Yeah, exactly. So it's not that signing. This is Underwhelming. cutter to an extent in MLS, which is a guy who gets bought out of a contract at turning 33 in December, is ready for the last stage of his career, and is going to come here. He will score goals. Inter Miami is a better team tomorrow if they sign him than they were yesterday. And mm-hmm. I would say with LGP and Matuidi as well, they're probably a playoff team in MLS in the Eastern Conference. So he's a good addition, but it isn't what we all wanted. And I wonder how much of that is what's going on in the world, that yeah. they weren't able to get a face-to-face meeting with a lot of people. The transfer markets are off in that players maybe don't feel comfortable making an aggressive move that's different from what they're used to, right? James Rodriguez, I'm going to go to Everton, play in the EPL, play for Ancelotti because the world's just weird right now. I don't want to move to a different continent and uproot my whole life, and I don't know where I'm going to be traveling for international and all those things. Playing Premier League? Right. I think all those things are a factor on top of the fact maybe for Miami, which is, you know, that first three games, that first 10 games, you want to pack the stadium, create an atmosphere, create an experience. That's not possible for another year maybe, maybe longer than that. So Iguain, you bring him in on a two-year deal here. Maybe you can buy a different DP down as you go forward next year. 
and then you make that move going into a time when you can open up your stadium and really have that experience. Can I just throw something out into the universe? Yes. Gonzalo Higuain, TAM player. Mm, no chance. No, it's not going to happen. It's not going to no. happen. But look, that, that like that parachute money from in turn <laughs> is pretty good. Like it seems like they just be did, dishing did it out. Matuidi? Plus, Ma- yeah, did. Matuidi got yeah. the bag, and then he came mm-hmm. over and he was like 1.5 in Miami. Cool, man. Cool. I'll be su- I'll be surviving on that. I think that Iwain will score a lot of goals in this league. I do. I do wonder I really a little do. bit about some of the chance creation for him because if you watch Inter Miami right now, that's not exactly their strong point. Um, but I do think with Matuidi and then Rodolfo Pizarro, I assume in the midfield, but maybe Pizarro is like out wide left and you're a little bit more defensive and give Matt Tweedy a little bit more freedom. And you're saying, Hey, you're an eight, but we're going to play you more in sort of that withdrawn role. So you can make late runs into the box. I, I don't know. I still wonder about the chance creation, I guess is what I'm saying. I think he will. It's not like Robbie Keane walking. And I know it's a different league, but it's not like Robbie Keane walking into a championship level galaxy side with Landon Donovan and David Beckham and like a proven defense midfield system and coach. Like, yeah, and they don't – I mean, look, I, I think they have a good coach, but he's not proven in MLS. It's just a, such a different situation. But in this environment, if you can get Gonzalo Higuain on a free, I don't understand why why you wouldn't do yeah. it other than for just like straight-up optics reasons, especially if it's for two years. That's our thoughts. Let us know what you think. 401 mls extra time at MLSsoccer.com. More transfer talk coming right now from Tom Bogert, Tommy Scoops. And follow us work at MLSsoccer.com. It's an AT&T call to the field. Tom, that's the best mustache I've ever seen on this show. I'm not going to lie, man. That is uh, both magnificent and disgusting. Am I am I the only one in that power rankings? I feel like that was just a default award. Yeah, I can't remember any others. I'm not going to lie to you, man. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, how do you feel about the Tommy Scoops moniker that we've – I don't know. We didn't give that – somebody gave that to you. I think it was Doyle. I, mean, I don't know. I, I saw it from Doyle and, and, and Bear and you, so, you know, we'll take it. <laughs> yeah, we'll make that thing stick. Let's talk about uh, what's going on in Major League Soccer. Let's start with Reggie Cannon. Uh, he is not with FC Dallas. All the reporting that he's trying to get to Portugal. What's the deal with the Portugal deal? Where does all this stand? So, yeah, uh, I reported on Friday that he, that Dallas and Bovisa had agreed to a deal in principle. And then, you know, Reggie was was flying out. I believe third degree said that first that he was leaving. But, yeah, so... I guess nothing has been announced yet. Um, I haven't heard anything that would suggest that something went wrong, even though it's been, you know, whatever, six days since that, that he went out. But, um, you know, unless that something catastrophic happens, uh, Reggie's going to be a Bo Visa player soon. Um, and that's an interesting move just because of the Lille connections there. Um, you know, I was told that, that Lille obviously are interested in them. You know, Bo Visa, I think that their transfer record fee was like 1 million before uh, Lille kind of came in and backed them. So, you know, this, this doesn't happen without Leo thinking that you're a good player. So, you know, he's going to get, you know, he's going to be the starting right back for, for both these uh, mid table Portuguese club. And, and they've already got um, um, a former Manchester United player, a teenager, uh, Angel Gomes. I might not be pronouncing that right, but you know, another, you know, rising young star and, and Bo Visa is kind of going to be a team where Leo can, can take players who might not be ready for the top of, of French football, but, but, are interesting players and kind of giving them a run in Portugal and, and that'll, that'll happen for, for Reggie. So it just depends on if he's ready, which I can't imagine that he's not ready for the mid table in Portugal. And, and, you know, it's just going to be a really good move all around. I think. Can I ask you where this fee might land? Like in um, what sort of ballpark are we talking here? So I, I don't have it confirmed, but what I, at the beginning, Dallas were looking for uh, three million, from what I was hearing, um, and I can't say if that's exactly what uh, Leo Bovis or whoever you want to call it paid for him, but um, I-, I can't imagine it'd be far off. Gotcha, gotcha. We know what the fee is for Fabio Reynoso, and of course, I didn't believe this was actually real, honestly, until last night when I watched him come on the field with a number ten shirt for Minnesota United in the middle of what it was a blowout against the Houston Dynamo. Uh, Adrian Heath did have a very interesting quote about him. Uh, Tom, he said basically that he thinks over the next few years, quote, he'll become one of the best players in MLS. How did this finally get done, and what does this mean for Minnesota? Well, first of all, with that, um, I respect Heath putting his name on that, and he did it like four or five times. Like, my whole life motto is under promise and over deliver. So, <laughs> you know, when you set the expectations that one of the best players in the league, like, if he has eight goals and eight assists, like, that would be a pretty good season or 10 and 10. But, like, if you say he's going to be one of the best players in the league, he, he better be having, you know, 20-plus goal contributions in a regular full season. But, yeah, I mean, Mark Watson 
<laughs> uh, back when traveling was a regular thing, a uh, frequent flyer to Argentina. Um, he said his first trip, he went, you know, back in January when it was first reported or whatever. He's like, you know, I hope that I'd be able to just kind of go down there and, and, you know, finalize the deal. And he's like, it didn't take long for me to realize that, like, I wasn't coming back with Reynoso this weekend and this was going to take a while. So um, they, they thought they had a deal and then it kind of didn't get over the finish line. And then, you know, talks cooled and then the pandemic happened. So talks definitely cooled. Um, and Minnesota kept on looking around, you know, they're ever, the ever changing short list and, and whatnot. Um, and like, they kept coming back to like, man, Reynoso would be the perfect fit. Like, Rey- like, can we get this deal done? Like, let's keep going. Like, let's keep trying. And then um, like Boca really didn't want to let him go. Um, and eventually like Reynoso kept pushing for it. And, you know, talks got back and Watson and Heath and the rest of the front office kind of got this deal to a place where again, it was at the, you know, 95%. Uh, figure of of you know we're almost done we're at the final stages and then an unnamed Brazilian club comes in with with an offer that Minnesota say would have been vastly more lucrative for Boca and very much more lucrative for Reynoso and he said no like I'm I'm committed to coming to Minnesota I'm committed to making this happen. Interesting. One of the other teams we've talked about because of the lack of moves at times is Nashville. Uh, rumors coming out that John Der Cadiz is headed over from Benfica. Is that the move they need, and is that one of many, uh, or they just think that they just need to fill in a number nine? So it's definitely not that they just need to fill in a number nine if this if this move kind of comes to fruition. Uh, I believe a- Ebola in Portugal were reporting it, and, and there's been a lot of smoke here. Um, National are in a good spot where they don't feel like pressure or the need to just sign a DP just to sign them. Like they're not gonna. Like, be like, oh, God, we have a game in, in three weeks against Atlanta or whoever it is. Like, I, we got to get somebody in right now. Like, you know, they – like, Mike Jacobs has talked often about that, you know, it wasn't a rush to fill 30 roster spots. It wasn't a rush to spend all of their allocation money. He wanted to, you know, see what this club was going to look like on the field with a representative sample size. And obviously, they're still not there yet with eight games played rather than the 25 that they would have had in a normal season. But um, they're not just going to pull a deal just to pull a deal. And – with with if Cadiz comes, that that might have been fueled by you know the pandemic, and and it might have been an opportunity that was too good to pass up. Um, and this guy, you know, he's bounced around a little bit on loan. He's a Benfica player who hasn't made an appearance for Benfica, which isn't entirely uncommon considering just how many players that they have and how many players they have out on loan. But he was playing in in Ligon. He scored against PSG in, in in a move where he kind of you know bodied off Thiago Silva, and and he's just kind of a guy who's, who's a, who's a big body, but, but also good with his feet, like a modern kind of big striker. So we're talking about expectations here. What about Philadelphia unions, youngsters and Mark McKenzie and Brent Aronson MLS's back tournament. We heard, Oh, Celtics in form Bundesliga clubs. What's the latest with those two? So nothing, nothing uh, really big, you know, not, not too much since I guess the reports broke um, and, and, the interest was Celtic for McKenzie and, and Ernst Tanner, you know, gave a, gave an interview where he said, yeah, balls in Celtic's court right now. We're waiting for them to come back and they haven't come back yet. And, you know, they have their own problems, you know, not advancing in the Champions League qualifiers, which was a big surprise. So um, I guess in a perfect world, uh, Philadelphia would get to keep both of these players through the end of the season. Um, but, you know, that's obviously not always possible because if a team comes in with the bag and says, you know, we'll take them, you know, yes or no, right now, we need them right now. Um, they're going to accept if it hits their valuation. Um, but right now, nothing is imminent, and there are offers, but but the vibe that I was getting was that not to expect anything right now. Um, I hope that doesn't make me sound stupid in case something breaks in the coming days. But, you know, in a perfect world, both of these players would stay at Philly through the winter and then probably make their move in, in the winter transfer window uh, because just of how difficult it is to replace not only their quality in, in this time during a pandemic, but – on the budget hits that they're at, you know, Aronson is whatever, 100 or 150,000, like, and he's been an above average attacking midfielder in MLS. And you just can't get that, uh, you know, value for, for a player like that. So what's their valuation as far as when a club comes in, what, what's the magic number to sell an Aronson and what's that number to sell McKenzie? Uh, I don't, uh, I haven't been told any specific figures, which is probably smart because you don't want to, you know, back yourself into, um, you know, if somebody was thinking about 5 million say, and, and, and something comes out that Philly are looking for three, you're just costing yourself money. So, you know, Tanner and that front office are, are too smart to kind of put, you know, hard figures out there. And I, and I guess that they're, we just wait until uh, when, whenever those, you know, real bigger bids come in. 
So this is a weird time, and, and we've repeated it over and over with you, with Paul, with everybody we talk to. Uh, and you see it when I think about those those rumors and those reports around Aronson and McKenzie. Like, is January going to be different? Or is the market going to be in more upheaval? Is their market value going to go up? Do they want to move at that time because it's a weirder time for them personally to get into a team in Europe? As you talk to GMs and agents and everybody around this little soccer world, what are the little nuggets and takeaways that you take when you think about transfer windows, the market, timing, and the pandemic? Because they're all intertwined. Yeah, so that's kind of where this conversation starts. Where It's super unfortunate. Like, I guess we we'll keep on talking about Philly. Like, they have two players that are, are genuinely sought after by a number of clubs in Europe, particularly, like, with, with Aaron Sin, when, like, I've reported Hoffenheim are, are one that I've heard a lot, and, a, you know, half dozen uh, Bundesliga teams and, and whatnot. Like, that should have been... They, yeah, that should have been a bit of a bidding war, but it hasn't because of the pandemic, particularly a team like Bruges, as you say, Charlie, and, and some of the smaller teams, like, they rely more on gate. They rely more on fans. So just it's unfortunate because this could have been a big summer for things to kind of move up. And, you know, Diego Rossi and all of the players at LAFC have that they could be selling right now. It's just the market's a little deflated. And, you know, all these guys, all these GMs are smart and, and analytics and whatnot. But sometimes it just comes down to like, man, it sucks. Like, I, you know, I wish that things were normal. This was a normal transfer window. You know, it's just really hurting it. But, you know, again, the good news, like MLS is, you know, place in the global transfer market and the global market is rising. It genuinely is. Um, And again, there would have been bigger steps taken this summer, if not for the pandemic. But again, like Reggie's move is, is is still look like, looks like it's going to happen. So it's not, it's not like it's completely stalled. Um, I had a GM tell me that a head of recruitment for a champions league level club in the premier league, um, you know, called this market, one of the most interesting in, in the world to follow right now, probably because just, of its reputation lagging behind. And, and, you know, when you see what Alfonso Davies and Tyler Adams are doing, it's like, oh, oh, like they have like legitimate players there. Um, you know, Celtic has a full-time scout here. You know, it, it's changing and, and the pandemic doesn't help, but, but it's moving forward. And, you know, the more players that like, again, you don't even have to put the bar at Alfonso Davies because you can't expect that from, from all these guys getting sold. But, but even if Reggie goes and, and immediately he settles in pretty quickly, he's a good player. And then if and when, you know, Aronson and McKenzie go, and then they settle in and they're good players. And it doesn't need that all of them need to it. But then the next time that, say it with, with Reggie, say say if the fee is $3 million, the next time that a club comes in for Pax and Pomical or, or whoever, or Jesus Brian Ferrari, Reynolds, say his name. Brian, Brian Reynolds. The next time a club comes in for one of those guys and, and instead of in the Reggie negotiations, maybe it's, all right, three, fair enough. It's like, no, no, no. You saw what Reggie is doing. You saw Chris Richards, Weston McKinney came through our academy, add another $2 million to that fee. And then clubs won't be able to take that hard line negotiation because there's going to be more interest. And it's just MLS is growing in in the global market. Um, And I know it sounds like the company line, but, but it's true. The pandemic isn't helping, but you know, things are moving for the better. Yeah. We're always looking for that next one. We talk about this all the time. It can be a little frustrating to wait, but it is not a snap your fingers and it's done process. These deals are complicated. It takes time. Tommy scoops, Tom Boger. How do people follow your work? MLSsoccer.com of course, but tell them about the Twitter. Yeah, just Twitter at, at Tom Bogart for some, you know, lukewarm takes and, and maybe a couple pictures of my dog. And a mustache or two as well. Thank you so much, Tom. We appreciate you, man. Appreciate you having me, fellas. Oh, Tom Bogart. Tommy Scoops. Got to love him. Follow him on Twitter. Follow can him I, on soccer.com. Can I just throw one thing in, which is he talked about, you know, the lack of the transfers we think that are going to come in. But the other thing we have to say is I'm pretty sure that, like, U23, MLS Academy, Canadian – U.S. national team eligible players set a record this week for amount of minutes played. So I, there's something interesting happening, which is we've sold players on potential very rarely on they've played at this level in MLS that the exact level we want to see them play in Europe. A lot of it's on potential. It'll be interesting to see if more if players that are a little more established can step in quicker in Europe going forward, because that's the other part is he talks about for FC Dallas. If Reggie Cannon can find his feet, you could sell at a higher number. But also, if Reggie Cannon hits the ground running, you can say to a team, it's more expensive not just because of his future value, but because he'll be competitive for you now, which hasn't always been the case. That wasn't what Jordan Morris was going to do if he had gone to Europe. That's not what Gio Reyna did exactly. You know, it took a year, a year and a half, whatever it is. Uh, So it could be an interesting way this plays out, which is having these guys be pro-ready, starter-ready going over next year after the minutes they played this year. Yeah, it's a first-team player. I also wonder about the cart coming before the horse or vice versa as, as 
where it's like, yeah, we can't sell players now, but because of the pandemic, because of the congestion, because of everything else, or maybe just to sort of an ideological shift, more young players are getting time. And I'd have to go dig into the numbers because sometimes the like anecdotally you think that, and maybe that's not the case, but something is changing in this league. We'll see how it pays off down the line. We're going to talk to Julian Araujo in just a second. He's another one of those guys, just like you're talking about, Dave, who's getting these first team minutes, thriving, has youth international chops, is getting interest at the international level from both the U.S. and Mexico, uh, and was part of a big win, again, for the LA Galaxy. Things are changing, it seems, for them. 3-2 up in Portland. Now, of course, Gio Savarese and Merritt Paulson and everybody else associated with the Timbers is real mad about that Jeremy Obobese goal that was called offside, but... We'll leave that one for instant replay with Charlie and I devote a lot of time to and just talk Galaxy because this was another big, big win for them. And now it's not like, oh, they're Zlataning their way through. There seems to be something intentional and they didn't have Chicharito. Yeah. Well, first of all, let's go Julian Araujo and Efra Alvarez starting on the right wing. I want to stand up and stanky leg right now. That makes me so happy. <laughs> but I know nothing, I'm nothing is stopping myself. you. Nothing is stopping I'll you. I'll just give you a little shimmy on that Whoa. one. That gives you... The juice. That's what it's all about. But I'll say this. I think Doyle talked about it a little bit on Monday. They're no longer pushing out wide and whipping in crosses. You see what Christian Pavone's doing. But I could give you 10, 11 instances in this game that if it was Chicharito instead of Ethan Zubak, LA Galaxy are creating dangerous chances or they're scoring goals. So it's really exciting to see where they're at and then think about the pieces that they can bring in. The back line has stabilized. Joe Corona had a good game in this one. He Harry Houston looks solid, and he's probably not a starter when this team's healthy. Uh, so there's a lot of excitement around the Galaxy because it's not just results. The performances have gotten better over the last three games, and they've been fun to watch. I love to see Efra get his first in MLS, too. I mean, oh, my God. just The ball just sticks to his left foot in a place where I know many, many players who are more established with, quote, unquote, a better pedigree panic. This dude's completely cool and calm. Top corner. It's what we've expected from him for so, so long. We know Julian Araujo is his boy, and he's on the line now. Coming to us from California after a big win. It's an AT&T 5G call to the field. Julian Araujo, what's up, man? What's up? How are you guys doing? We are doing well. We got a lot to talk with you about. This LA Galaxy team is rolling. Uh, you know, first goal for Efra, your fellow homegrown. But uh, I just want to know, man, because I'm always curious. A 19-year-old kid... Where are you right now? Where are you living? Are you still at home? What is your life like? Yeah, so I'm actually not living at home. Um, I've been living away since I first started with Galaxy. Uh, I lived in Long Beach, and now I'm living in Costa Mesa. Um, but yeah, I mean, life's life's good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm getting some minutes in right now. I'm trying to stay positive, trying to take in these opportunities and, and make the most out of them. I'm taking advice from everybody and and just keeping my keeping my feet on the ground, just keeping it going. Why did you choose to live on your own? What was what was it about that you needed that? So my my um, where I'm from is actually like three hours away from uh, from the stadium. So that's why kind of wasn't gonna make the drive every day. Um, a lot of traffic. So yeah, I felt like and and I've also like I like this. I just like the feeling of just being alone, being on my own, and making decisions on my own. So. Um, that, that's another reason why why um, I'm living now by myself. Julian, you, you've really made strides in your game this season. And can you talk about where you've made the biggest improvements from last year to this year? I think my biggest improvement is just my confidence. Now I think um, that's that's one of the things that I've improved on. I mean, last year I didn't have the have the confidence that I do now, and um, I think it was just um, just the uh, what can I say like. Um, just the training, just getting extra training in and, and having guys talk to me about things I need to work on, coaches telling me what I need to work on, uh, things that, I, that, I'm, that I'm doing well in. And uh, I've, I've always been a hard worker, so I, I think uh, it's actually paying off now. And I think that, um, um, that with me continuing to, be, to, to get my minutes in and if I continue to do this, I think that, that I, can be, I can be a player that, at a high caliber. You, you mentioned people talking to you about what you need to work on. It's a pretty star-studded roster to come into as a kid. It was Laton last year. You've got Mexican legends like Jonah and, and Chicha and USMNT guys like Sebastian Leggett. Who takes you under their wing? Who's talking to you? What is it that they're saying to you? 
a lot of them actually every every player on the field is talking to me um players that play my position players that don't play my position veteran guys uh i i, I take it i take um advice from everybody they're just telling me to that that i have all the everything i i, I have or i have everything in a player i just got to go out there with confidence and i think that's that's really what what has built my confidence them them telling me that i have everything them telling me that i'm good them telling me that what I'm good at and what I need to apply to my game, my speed, I got, I got to use it. I think that's just gave me confidence to just go out there and, and make a difference in those, in those aspects. So one of the guys in a similar situation as you is Efra Alvarez scores the first MLS goal yesterday. On one hand, tell us a little about him as a person and player, because he's epic to watch at such a young age. And then maybe take us a little into that experience of making the decision because you have your heart on both sides in Mexico and in the U S and a lot of people maybe don't know what the experience is like and give them a little idea of what that battle is. Okay. Yeah. So Efra, Efra is a very good player. He can be one of the best players. I mean, Eber said it himself. Um, I think he, he has everything uh, he needs. Um, he, I think um, he has a lot of potential for himself. I think if he continues to work hard and, and like Guillermo said in, in his interview with the, with the media is, um, He's been working really hard. He's been working. Like, he's been training like a pro. He's been getting there really early and um, and getting and leaving pretty late. He's been working out a lot more. He's been um, trying to. He, he. I think he does have. He set a goal for himself, and I think he's going to reach that. Um, that this is one of many goals for him. Um, I think that goal was fantastic. I'm very proud of him, and and as as my boy, I think I think he. That's what. Um, that's how people are going to know him. He's going to score a lot of goals. He's definitely so, going to score a lot of goals. So, Julian, when you uh, play with guys like Slatan, guys like Jonah DeSantos, Chicharito, and they're telling you guys work hard. If you put in the work, you come in early, you leave late, you're gonna you're gonna reach these heights that you want: Champions League, mm -hmm. World Cups. And now you're starting to see Efra bangs the yeah. upper corner. You you know getting all these plaudits, getting up and down, being involved in goals. That is paying off. How how much does that motivate you to, to even push on more? It, it motivates me. I mean, after after the LAFC game, after um after uh games that I've done well and I've I've gotten feedback from from those type of players, from Chicha, from from Jonah, from Seba, from from all the veteran guys, and they're telling me if I continue to be like that, it's it's gonna be hard for for me to get my starting position taken away. So I just got to keep my feet on the ground and continue to work hard, and it, it's definitely motivating and. Um, it's definitely something that I that I wake up every day and just want to I, I definitely want to wake up or I wake up every day and just want to keep a starting spot and keep my minutes. Can I can I get you back though, Julian, on that decision? Because I do think it's important for people oh, to yeah. understand, man, like that this is just so personal for you. If you're not if you're not in it, if you're not experiencing it, if that's not, you know, your family, your home, your identity, how do you know? And I just, I just would love to hear from you how you kind of go through that, that battle in your heart. Yeah, so it's definitely hard. Um, I definitely stress a, a lot about it when I receive calls from both coaches, from from both staffs. I, I definitely stress a lot. I definitely, um, it's definitely hard because I, I have dual citizenship. I can play for both teams, um, and I've just, I've kind of just put aside uh that my na my national team um decisions right now and just because i'm getting minutes in right now i'm just trying to focus on my club um but i think that um for me being 19 receiving calls from both from both um from both sides it, it's it's a pretty d tough decision and not a feeling I, I like to feel um but yeah like i said earlier i'm, j I'm just waiting on whoever gives me the better opportunity and so far us has given me it um, but I mean, I, you never know what can happen. Mexico can come, can come to me and, and promise me something and, and it's bigger than us and, and it's going to be for, and I'm going to go with whoever's, um, going to make me more successful in my career. That's long the big term. thing, right? Yeah. That's long the big term. Thing, is like trying to understand what it means long-term when you say the best opportunity, the biggest opportunity, what do you, what does that mean to you? Um, being maybe um just like i don't know just if i'm going to play first team if i'm going to play the u20s if i'm going to go with with the olympic team it's it's different like i i've had 
um i've had us promise me stuff and i've also had mexico promise me stuff and right now it's kind of like even so i haven't really made a decision I'm, I'm just taking my time so um yeah i'm just i'm just waiting i would imagine it's it's all about the plan what what is yeah. what where what do you see plan? me right in the future right. am i the first choice right back or is it you know are there three guys that and whoever's playing the best then is going to get the nod and obviously yeah, I, I think as a player sure. you just want clarity yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. For sure. That's, that's definitely my main thing. That's what me and my agent were also talking about. Before I make any decision, we got to make sure uh, they have a plan for me and what their plan is and, and if they're going to stick to that plan. So you've talked about confidence a bunch in this interview and in your playing style, but it seems like there's also a level of chippiness to you. You, in that LAFC game, you push someone over, Mark Anthony K gets in your <laughs> face. You're after it. The Seattle or the Portland game, you got an early yellow card, tough tackle. You're only 19, but it seems like you have this level of competition that's already ingrained in you that you, you know, you're ready to go into battle. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've always been like that. I've always played with people older than me, and, I, and I've just never seemed to back down. I mean, the um, LAFC game is just a game that I'm always hyped for. Every game I'm hyped for, but that that's just a little extra hype for me. Um, so it's a game that I've always wanted to play in as a kid and everybody wants to play in as a kid. So for me, it's, it's something that, that I take in and, and I just go out there and do whatever I got to do. And to be honest, I'm not even thinking about getting into it like that. It just happens to be at the moment, but um, it's all good. You know, it's, it's a game. It's, it's the love that I have for it. And, and I wanted to win. So and that it's a man's Portland game. One, yep. Uh, you want to step to Julian? You better watch out. <laughs> that Portland game that actually hurt me. <laughs> that actually hurt me. So, you're a Galaxy Academy guy. What does it mean to play for this team in this city? What does it mean to play against LAFC from an LA native? Um, uh, to play for the to play for the club. I mean, it's the best feeling in the world. It's one of the most successful clubs here. It's the most successful club here in, M in MLS. I, I think um, um, they've done a lot of great things and I want to continue to be a part of that. Um, but no, I'm blessed. I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity that I've, that I've been given. Um, I just take it, take it in every day and, and wake up and, and I'm blessed. So, um, what's the, what's what the coolest, what's the coolest thing you've done with the galaxy off the pitch? Because I know there's, there's this battle now for, LAFC, LA Galaxy, who's getting, who's, who's going to the best movie premiere, who's hanging out with certain celebs, you, just, you know, you got Sebastian, they love the boy legit, like Jonah DeSantos, who, who are you hanging out with? What are you doing? What's, what's, uh, what are these LA Galaxy kids up to these days? Uh, yeah, so. He's trying Coolest to not get in trouble. You can already tell. Coolest thing. <laughs> Coolest thing. Um. I've had, I've done a lot of cool things. I mean, just meeting new people is probably one of the coolest things for me. I love meeting new people, making new friends. Um, um, I'm an open guy. Like I like to, to go do stuff. So, um, we going to Soho house or what? Oh, is that? We going to Soho house to hang out? Yeah, I don't even know what you're talking about. Come on over here. Come on over here. Who's, who's the I guy on the team that if they invite you out you know you're going no questions i'm not saying like out out i'm saying just like go to do something cool meet some people who's yeah. the guy just like he has the cool factor he like is rodeo drive yeah, cafes yeah. yeah like that's kind of what we do just go drive around and go like shopping well not now but like when, when yeah. we were um jonathan <laughs> yeah. okay. I mean the hat yeah. the hat game for Jonathan is very LA. He's really figured out the like he has the custom the hat LA game. style for sure. Mm -hmm. for so he's sure. passing on the style to you, of course. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yep. Yeah, All for right. sure. I'm learning a Jill, lot from him. <laughs> we we wanted to close you out though. Uh we've been following some of the stuff you've been talking about in the media, on social media, uh about immigrant worker rights out in California, uh, communities you're from, backgrounds that you have. Uh, tell people a little bit about what all of this means to you, uh, what it means to see videos of people out in the field in 90 degree weather working for below minimum wage jobs next to a wild forest fire. Yeah, so for me, it's it's a big thing. It's something that I think they deserve. I think they deserve a lot more than what, they, they're, what, what they're actually getting. I think that... Um, I've had actually family members and friends that go through through the situations that are that they're going in through that they're going through right now. 
Um, so for me, it's it's a huge thing and something that I'm that I'm working on and something that I'm trying to trying to make a difference in, um, and I'm gonna continue to try to make a difference in. Um, uh, I actually fed a couple a couple uh, food tr- or farm workers um, about a month or two ago. Um, but there's other things that I want to do for them. I think um, I'm going to make a don- donation to the, um, damn, see, I just lost my mind. Um, no, it's all good. The United Farm Workers, I think it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm going to make a donation to them. And uh, I'm going to put a link out there for anybody else that wants to make a donation to them. Um, I'm actually going to get in contact with the, I've actually been in contact with the, with one of the head people that, that are working for them. And I just want to make a difference with them as well, and I and I want to partner with them to try to, to try to make a difference for for their worker for the workers, and because um, for me I think they deserve a lot more than what they're actually getting. Um, I know they wake up, um, I, I know they wake up feeling blessed and feeling they're going another day of work, and and their attitude for their attitude to go to work um, is different. So I think, uh, like I said, I just I just want to go out there and make a difference and and hopefully help them help them get. Um, get what they deserve. Uh, so you mentioned you helped feed some. I know your mom delivered some food for you. I also read that you wrote on a card in English and Spanish for everyone. When the sun rises, you go to work. When the sun goes down, you continue working. Thank you for working with your hands, your heart, and your mind. What did it feel like to help out a little? And what do people maybe who don't have this connection, what should they know about the situation out in California and across the U.S.? Uh, yeah, so... Um... I did that. I did that because I just wanted to do it at heart, and I think that that they deserve it. And all their hard work during this during this pandemic isn't going unnoticed. And and I also think they're essential workers, and and they're they're a big part of part of our lives. And um, um, I didn't really do it for 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 so I didn't do it so that people could text me, recognize me. I, I just did it out of my heart. I didn't even want anybody to know, but somehow the media got there and did it. Um, but um, what was your other question again? No, I just, where did those words come from that you wrote? Where did those words come? Oh, the one that I wrote on the note? Mm-hmm. Uh, me and my mom actually came up with it. Yeah. Respect. Just respect. Love it. Love it. Well, here we are making a bigger deal out of it, but uh, we'll let you go back and do it in silence, man. Unless, uh, you know. Uh, a mower comes out out of nowhere to attack you as it did. Chainsaw, <laughs> chainsaw mower. Oh my god! Timber Joey. Just to make up. A, I haven't seen you. I haven't seen you back down on the field, but man, you were in the corner by the door, just just waiting. Everywhere, I was everywhere. I was getting moved around. <laughs> yeah, you were, Julian. Thanks for giving the time to us. Good luck with everything. Galaxy playing well. You're playing well. We love to see it. Yeah. Thank Congrats, you so much, man. guys. I hope all you guys are doing well and staying safe. All right, Julian Rajo being. Uh, being moved around his own house by the yard work. If you were a little bit of annoyed, maybe by the background noise, I think so was he. He was trying to figure out where a quiet place would be. Give me one thing from uh, this midweek action, guys, that we haven't talked about that probably isn't going to lead MLS soccer.com, but that matters. Charlie, what do you got? What are you thinking about? What'd you see? RSL playing against Seattle Sounders. And, and we've seen what Seattle Sounders have, have been able to do um, over the course of, of, the MLS is back tournament and now uh, post post tournament for the restart. They're just flying. You know, they, they took it to LAFC. This is a team that it's tough to deal with and RSL with all the controversy going on with, with their ownership coming together and starting to put in results. They go down two one to Seattle and they get the big result. It, it, it shows that this team is really coming together. Uh, Giuseppe Rossi is starting to find his form. He's, he's getting fit and that's only going to help them. The goal to tie it up was fabulous. I mean, it was absolutely hammered. And you just see the celebrations, what it means to this team. Uh, I think RSL, obviously, they're not going to get the headlines for for a 2-2 result at home. But this is an impressive performance from Real Salt Lake. I've seen Ruiz hit that shot like probably a handful of times in games. And he always connects cleanly and it either gets saves or just miss. So to see him actually put that thing over the line and get the draw was awesome. And then he got taken right off. So we had time to think about it and celebrate <laughs> a little. Some news with RSL, uh, the chief business officer, basically the right-hand man of Deloitte Hansen, Andy Carroll, he's on leave now as well, being investigated. A lot of allegations come out. I'm sure you're reading about those at 
RSL Soapbox, who have done an amazing job covering all of that's going on with Real Salt Lake, as well as ESPN and The Athletic and et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to go Ariel Lassiter, who didn't really, you know, he's an LA Galaxy 2 guy. Didn't really happen for him his first go around at MLS, but he went down to Costa Rica. He balled out. He's back. He got the brace in his first game. He wanted the hattie, he said. And Minnesota got run over by Darwin Quintero and the Houston Dynamo, which had to not feel great if you're a Minnesota United fan or Adrian Heath, but I'm a big fan of Ariel Lassiter going someplace else, finding his form, maturing a little bit, becoming a better player, and coming back and showing what's up. I think that's really, really cool. Dave, what did we miss that you're thinking about? Well, one, Darwin Saran and Memo Rodriguez dominating for Houston. But on my own game, no one respects the Columbus crew. That's not true. What are you talking about? Season. I – have been respecting them since day one of the season. Call them the first place Columbus crew, all right? If you're going to really put respect on them. my right. pick. This is my squad. Even when they're oh, here he goes. back, all of a sudden, they did it again. And we talk about Zellerion and Nagby and Zardes. They have so many great pieces. Valenzuela looks super healthy, and he's breaking ankles. But Eunice Mokhtar, playing out on the wing, got hurt. And you could see them have to kind of scramble things around when he was out. Just so clean in possession, sees the game so well. He allows Valenzuela to find that space. He's the one that plays those balls cleanly into Zeller Ion's feet when he's charging into the box or set up Zardes. This Columbus team has hit on a lot of big signings. They've hit on a lot of different signings. And I think Mokhtar is going to be one of those guys that maybe goes under the radar, but it's such a key piece of everything they do that he's either leaving Pedro Santos or Luis Diaz, both at one time DPs on the bench. I mean, that's that's the sort of uh, depth that you need to compete in this league right now. Let's uh, before we get to the mailbag, just hit MLS Predict Six presented by Bet MGM. Make sure you go get your picks in. Of course, you have to pick the game, the result, as well as a little bit of a a side pick as well. What game do we want to preview, guys? I'll let you make the choice here. Make predictions on. We've got El Tráfico. Maybe that'd be a good one to come back to. Seattle, yeah. Portland, Minnesota RSL, Columbus, Cincy. Little hell is real. I think you got to go with one of the two rivalry games. Mm-hmm. I mean, Orlando Atlanta's in this too. That's now a rivalry officially because Orlando has won, but I'm going to make an executive decision and say El Trafico. Make your picks. Who you got in this match? LAFC, of course, smacking as they seem to always do. Mateus Almeida in the Quakes 5-1 on Wednesday night. Charlie, who you got in this match? Resurgent Galaxy? Not panicking, not in crisis LAFC? Who wins this thing? You had to put me on the spot. With I this know, that's the this, point. That's, this, like this the, one, that's what this whole segment's this, about. Yeah, but this, one, this one's really tough um, because every bone in my body wants to say LAFC. They're finally figured out. Um, they're defending the goalkeeper situation. I feel like they're, they're ready to take that next step, but LA Galaxy are playing with so much confidence. I'm going to go with LA Galaxy for this one. I think they understand now how to get results against LFC. They're not scared. They're not intimidated anymore. It's a lot of these young players who are trying to make a name for themselves. Example, Julian Araujo. I really do believe that this team is playing with a ton of confidence, and Sebastian Legette is is starting to play how everyone expected and hoped he would play. He, he's in form. He's fit. He's great at connecting passes, finding the good spots, and he can take people on the dribble. I, I'm going to go Galaxy as well, which curses them. But Jonah got a good shift in against the Timbers. I think we'll see him start for the first time again in this game, which is a huge bonus to this team. But the big one for me with LAFC is question marks at right back. You want to play Latif there because he'll get into the attack. Can he defend against Christian Pavone? If it's not, can Tristan Blackman defend against Tr- Christian Pavone? Can, who can no. defend Christian Pavone? Whatever it is, that's mm-hmm. a math. Yeah, it's a massive – it's a massive disadvantage. I think that's the opportunity for the Galaxy, specific place to play through. And now that they're cleaner in the back, I think you are you allow your midfield to step higher up the field. You can press a little bit higher at time because you have confidence in what's behind you, at least not in goal, but along that back line. It's been so much better. So the Galaxy are cursed because we both picked them, but I'm going to take the Galaxy as well. I'm going to basically guarantee an LAFC win here by picking the Galaxy and making it three <laughs> for three. You know I got my shrine up and running, baby. Yeah, some of these guys are getting informed, but it's the candles, it's the flame, it's the love, you know, the put on love. I don't, you know, I don't really care, but I think it's going to be the galaxy. I think uh, I also look at LAFC and I just think, you know, they have a lot of weapons, but without Vela, without Atuesta, uh, who I still am not sure when he will be back, I think that the galaxy just have, for whatever reason, there's something about them in this matchup, even when they're down, even when they get punched in the mouth, 
or they can come back. So LAFC, congratulations on your three points. Uh, Bob, you can thank us later in person or by email or whatever you want to do with that. Let's go to the mailbag, 401-2060 MLS, extra time MLSsoccer.com. Take us through it, Dave, and we'll get out of here. Taylor from Switzerland says, PT moving to Saudi Arabia after their pretty underwhelming stint in MLS says more about MLS than it does PT. When he came here, every River Plate fan and Euro snob were going on about how he'd be the best MLS player ever. Ultimately, he was a pretty solid B signing. MLS is just more competitive of a league than the Argentine First Division. And if Davies winning the Champions League the same year and PT fades into obscurity doesn't prove that, nothing will. Mm. I love that we oh, – that's a take from Switzerland. I appreciate that. You know, there's nothing neutral about that one. <laughs> He's coming right out and saying it. What else we got? I see this DC here. Yeah, Noda Menton Hire says, for DC fans, how frustrated should we be with ownership? It feels like for the last couple of years, the club is constantly telling us that fans, they are back and aiming for trophies. However, outside of Rooney and the Flores move, even though the Rooney saga ended in disappointment and Flores hasn't hit yet, it seems like the club is only satisfied with acquiring players that are backup quality in today's MLS. Maybe Ooh. it's Ben Olsen, but it's hard to put blame on him when the current roster doesn't have a single player outside maybe Hamid that could sniff the MLS weekly best 11 on a consistent basis. Mm, I will throw in Gressel. That's rough. Yeah. You, you sign Gressel, who is not washed up, who's not old, and you don't play to his strengths. You sign Edison Flores, and he looks like a USL player because you, you're not playing to his strengths. He, he needs, he's a player that thrives in possession, that thrives in getting the ball to his feet. DC United have only played long balls. And a player like Ola Kamara... I was lucky, say is, is lucky to touch the ball three times in a game. D so it, regardless of who DC is trying to, to go after and as far as DPs in the world, they're not playing soccer. They're not playing attractive football. They're not playing to the strengths of their players. So that's all I'm going to, I'm going to leave you with that. I was a former DC United player. I loved everything about DC United. I love the fans. I love the city, but if you're not getting the tactics, right, you're not going to have success. If you're not if you're not playing a certain style that helps your team win games, you're not going to have success. I'll leave it at that. I don't agree. Yeah, I don't agree with with uh, with the writer saying that they don't have players that aren't capable. I think this mm -hmm. roster is perfectly capable of competing for a playoff spot. Got to find a way to get out of him. By the way, I just want to say, I know he's a villain for a lot of people. Felipe Martin Zotero's ACL this week. Just want to shout out Felipe and say, I hope he has a good recovery uh, from that injury. So, uh, last one here, Austin from Fort Worth. How much does not having fans hurt home field advantage for some? What are some of the things uh, other than fans that play into home field advantage? Do you expect more road wins this year? Charlie, I I'm curious about this because when I think about this, yes, no fans. The environment is a big deal. It changes mm -hmm. everything. But I actually think right now it's super bizarre for traveling teams because it's all same day. Yeah. Like instead of getting in the night before and settling, you're just you're in, you play, you're out. And to me, that would be tougher. But I'm curious what you think. Yeah, it's all about perspective. And I think for a lot of the traveling teams, you're not in a rhythm. You're not in the routine of getting up or sleeping in late, getting up, you know, taking your time all day. It's rushed. Sometimes teams are leaving at 6 a.m. versus 8 a.m., you know, versus 10 a.m. You get in. There's no time to really settle in. You have a pregame meal. Some guys like to nap. Some, some, sometimes that's disrupted. Then you get to the field, you play, and you're out. It is a disadvantage to travel, one. But to do it on the same day, a lot of these teams are not used to it. In Europe, you travel the same day, but it's only a two-hour flight, if that. You may, maybe it's an hour bus ride, a two-hour bus ride, and you're back home after the game. It's normal. Here, it's not normal. And so for, for teams, when you play at home, okay, you don't have fans, but you have the comfort of, of the routine, the rhythm. And so you get to the stadium and you can play your game. It, if you don't win at home, it's the same thing. It's a, it's a huge loss because you have an advantage for sure, and you have to take you have to take all three when you play at home. Shout um, out to Julian Araujo who got home at three a.m. and then quickly got back up to get on with us. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, the grind. that's the grind in MLS. Dude, right he, now. he looked he looked fresh. I'm not gonna lie, he looked fresh. Uh, I'm gonna throw this one in. Hank from Salt Lake City with Reynoso in the barn. That's a very Minnesota thing to say. Minnesota is uh, just injuries to Tyler Miller and Ike Opara away from having the best starting 11 in MLS. And that oh, stop. is a little bit much, but I will say that it leads me to this. We have not talked about Tyler Miller being out for the year, so just like Felipe Martins, hope mm -hmm. you get well soon, man. But, man, Ike Opara, we have not heard a peep on Ike 
in a long time now. It's been pretty quiet about what his status is and what's going to happen. That is a huge loss for Minnesota United and not having Ozzy Alonso. The two of them together on the field, or at least one, that really affects what they're doing. You saw that last night against the Houston Dynamo. We're getting out of here. 401 MLS, extra time at MLSsoccer.com. Anything you want to talk about, we will do so. Uh, not on Labor Day. Because we won't be here. We're going to do that show on Tuesday. But otherwise, the schedule stays the same. Use the hashtag Kick Childhood Cancer. Send out those messages of hope. Let us know if you know anybody that we should support or get behind. We need a cause for the month of September around childhood cancer and uh, curing or at least helping kids deal with all the different things that come with this terrible disease. Charlie, Dave, have a great weekend, guys. Same to you that's listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you.